Holy Gospel according to Mark, the fifth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd had gathered around him. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue named Jarius came And when he saw him, fell at his feet, he begged him repeatedly, my little daughter, my little daughter is at the point of death. Come, lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. So he went with him, and a large crowd followed him and was pressing in on him. Now, there was a woman who had been suffering for, from hemorrhages for 12 years. And she endured much under many physicians and spent all that she had had and was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus, and she came up behind him in a crowd and touched his cloak For she had said, if I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately, her hemorrhage stopped, and she felt in her body that she had been healed of her disease. Immediately, aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus stopped in the crowd and looked about. He said, who touched my clothes? His disciples said to him, you see every, the crowd pressing in on you. How can you say who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman who had known what had happened to her came in fear and trembling and fell before him and told him the whole truth. Jesus said to her, daughter, Your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. And while he was still talking, people, some people came from the leader's house to say, "Your, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, do not fear, but believe. He allowed no one to follow him except for Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion and people wailing, weeping and wailing. And when he had entered, he said to them, why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but only sleeping. And they laughed at him. Then Jesus put all of them outside. And he took the child's father and daughter, the child's father and mother, and those who were with him, and went in where the child was. And he took her by the hand and said to her, Talithakum, which means, little girl, get up. Immediately she got up and began to walk about. She was 12 years of age. At this, they were overcome with amazement. He strictly, Jesus strictly ordered them that no one should know this. And he told them to get her something to eat. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated and I'll invite some of the children to come up. If you want to come up this morning, we'll greet those who are joining us online as well. Anyone out there, give a wave. Wonderful. Good to see you. Good to see you guys. If you want to take a seat over there, that would be great. Yay. And we are um, good to see you all. So I want to ask you to think about something. Is there something that you guys have learned to do, but it took you a while to learn how to do it? So maybe... The first time you got on a bicycle, were you able to just to zoom right off and, and not have any problems? 
I know the first time I got on a bicycle, I had a couple of scraped up knees afterwards. Or maybe the first time, you probably don't remember, the first time you tried to walk, right? Don't remember that, but I bet you just didn't jump out of bed one day and start running around, right? But you worked at it. You had help. Your parents helped you in those things, and you kept on doing it. You kept on, you had persistence. And so it's another way of saying you kept on trying over and over and over and over again. One of the little things that I took me a while to learn, and it's still kind of sketchy, is shuffling cards. Sometimes it's difficult. Sometimes they don't go the way that we want them to. But sometimes, after you practice long enough and you have persistence, you can actually um, shuffle in different ways. Like I said, I wasn't the best at it, but it happens. So sometimes, if we get the cards just right, we can shuffle in fancy ways, right? And it's because I kept on trying over and over and over and over again. Jesus is doing that today. There's lots of points in our story today that Jesus could have just stopped. I mean, there was this large crowd and he had to get through it. There was a time where people are like, you know what? You can't help this guy's daughter anymore because she already died. So we might as well not even trouble you anymore. But Jesus said, no, I'm going to keep on going. I'm going to share the healing love of our God with everybody because Jesus keeps on going. Jesus keeps on trying. Jesus persists, keeps on doing what needs to be done, right? So the more that we try, the more that we persist, the more that we continue in helping others and loving others as God loves us, that's what we're called to do, even when it seems like it's going to be really hard or impossible sometimes. As long as we keep trying, God is with us to help us in doing that. All right, let us pray. Good and gracious God, you are awesome and we love you. We thank you for helping us help others. We thank you that you are the driving force to keep us going. When things are difficult or things are hard, sometimes impossible. Help us to continue to love you and to love others as you love us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Thank you for coming up this morning. Grace, mercy, and peace from our Creator and our Lord Jesus Christ to you this morning. So a couple of weeks ago, we, we heard Jesus say that the kingdom of God was as if someone would take seed and scatter it on the ground and would sleep and rise, and the seed would sprout and grow. He did not know how. Makes me wonder if the women knew how. Anyway, the smallest of all the seeds would grow into the greatest of shrubs so that birds of the air made their nests in its shade. And last week, I connected between... Um, Psalm 107, which states, God made the storm be still and the waves of the sea were hushed. Then they were glad because they had quiet. And God brought them to their desired haven, which is the calm of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is all around us. We are the birds of the air able to make our nests in its shade. As we quiet the chaotic world around us, we find our desired haven in the calm, knowing that we are fully known, accepted, and loved by our Creator. This week, Jesus is teaching those around them, around Him in the gospel, and to us as we hear it, what the kingdom of God is as we share it with others. First, Let's get back to that scene where Jesus has calmed the windstorm and the disciples were terrified. What happened immediately after? We really don't know. But maybe they allowed Jesus to fall back asleep and they dealt with their own questions of who this Jesus is. But I think, at least I like to think, that they continued to ask questions and Jesus answered them with love and graciousness. I think this is because 
at least it, it appears to me that Jesus was not yet well rested because of this ongoing conversation. We know that they finished the trip across the lake because even though the lectionary skips the part of uh, this part of the gospel, it is where upon reaching um, Gerasene, Jesus heals the demon-possessed man. So this is after that, and that's why it says again, he crossed the sea again. So this is the second leg of the trip. They have made their way back to Galilee, where Jesus is greeted by this great crowd. I believe Jesus is still a bit tired and not fully recharged. Yet after hearing that the little daughter of Jairus, the, the leader of the synagogue, needs help, he goes with them. And of course, the crowd follows him and presses in on him. So much to the fact that no one notices this woman who comes up behind Jesus and touches his cloak. This woman is very brave. It's important that we understand her despair. The, the author of Mark's gospel, the, the shortest of all the gospels, goes into the most detail about this woman. She had spent the last 12 years visiting many physicians enduring everything that they suggested and spent all of her money. And she was not any better. Her hope was exhausted. No one could help her until she hears about Jesus. Now, we don't know how she heard about Jesus. Maybe the word of Jesus' healing you know, actually traveled faster than, than he did, which would explain the crowds. Or she was just in the right time in the right place and figured she had nothing to lose. Yet something gave her the faith to reach out and touch just the hem of his cloak. And in doing so, she believed her health would be restored. And she could live again. Now, this was no small task of her just making her way through the crowd. If she was in the area for any time at all, people would have known her condition, a condition which would have made her ritually unclean. It would make sense that if she were trying everything to get better, she would have been known as a person who was unclean, and people would stay clear of her. Because if she touched you or they touched her, both parties would have been made unclean ritually. Now, ritual uncleanliness always corrupted the clean. A word about ritually unclean. Un, or ritually unclean did not mean sin. There are, many, several, there are several ways where one could become ritually unclean. If a person happened to touch a dead body or worked with dead bodies, or they touched a corpse of an unclean animal, or some misunderstood discharge of bodily fluids, they would be ritually unclean. And to become ritually clean, they had to go through ritual cleansing and or wait a, a certain number of days or hours to regain ritual cleanliness. The, the sinful part of being ritually unclean would be to su touch someone or to commit some action knowing that you were ritually unclean. That is how we know that this woman was at her last option. Think about it. She was hemorrhaging for nonstop for 12 years. She could not be with her husband if she was married or she could not enter into marriage because of her condition. She could not go to temple as she was unclean. She could not get a job. She couldn't be around people for 12 years. We know that her faith, as small as it might have been, was her last resort. Now hold that thought. That, that thought that she reached out to Jesus as her last resort for healing. As we go back to the Jesus' journey to help um, Jarius' dying daughter. He heads out, and of course, the crowds follow, and they're pressing in on him, and he feels this power that has gone out from him and asks, who touched me? And his, his disciples are like, are you serious right now? You're in the middle of a crowd. 
How can you ask who touched me? And I'm wondering at that point, in Jesus' exhaustion, if he's kind of rethinking, calming that storm, and maybe rolling his eyes a little bit at, at the disciples. So, so Jesus may be just frustrated, is looking all around to see who had done it. And after the woman comes forward, she confesses to the whole truth, Jesus claims her as a daughter, a child of God, affirms her faith and sends her forward in peace and in new life. The woman's faith, as small as it was, even if it was her last resort, became her salvation. Now, as he was still speaking, more people show up from the leader's house to give him the bad news of his daughter's death. And if that's not enough, they kind of lay on this guilt trip and say, why trouble the, the teacher any further? Now, in my mind, I still see the human side of Jesus. And as he overheard this, just roll his eyes. Like, you people are not getting this. Can you imagine the look on Jairus' face when Jesus finally says, do not fear, only believe. I feel at this point, Jesus is done with those people that have come to make this announcement. After all, he doesn't allow any of the followers, any of those people that came along with him, or three-fourths of his disciples to go any further. He hand-selects Peter, James, and John, and they go with him. And when they arrive, he's the one who notices this commotion. He allowed no one to follow them except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, when they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. Jesus is the one stepping into the mourning of those experiencing the loss of this little girl and again brings hope. He asks, why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead. She is sleeping. In response, they could have done anything. And what do they do? They laugh. Now I believe Jesus is really done because he puts everybody else out. Family only and those people that I brought with me. He goes in where the child was. He takes her hand. He says, little girl, get up. And literally, she is resurrected. She gets up. She walks about. It's a preview of what hope in the kingdom of God looks like. As Jesus will be resurrected and the hope that we are given as children of God, it is the hope that each of us have for our final day living here on earth. But this hope which Jesus brings of the kingdom of God is not only meant for our last days on earth before we enter the pearly gates. Jesus shows us it is the hope of the desperate here and now just like the hemorrhaging woman. The hope of the kingdom of God which Jesus brings is for those who think hope is lost, like those laughing at Jesus. It is the hope that we have every time we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done. It is the hope Jesus gave Jairus when he says, have no fear, but believe. We've been in this pandemic for so long, and we finally have some hope. But there are people out there who want to get back to the normal. This past week, I was visiting someone in an assisted living facility, and they have a screening process, and you have to have your temperature taken, and you have to get a mask. And while I was there, there was these delivery people, and they wanted to bring in this mattress. And they were, you could tell they were on the clock because they were moving kind of fast, just trying to get around the screening process. And the lady behind the desk said, whoa, 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 guys, you also have to get your temperature taken and a mask. And the one delivery guy said, I thought COVID was over. He, he definitely is longing to get back to normal. Just like the hemorrhaging woman wanted to get back 
before the 12 years, just like Jairus wanted to get back before his daughter felt ill, just like we all want to get back to what it was like before COVID. But the inbreaking of God's kingdom is much more than getting back to normal. Returning to normal is, is like the Israelites wanting to go back to Egypt. The kingdom of God is making all things new. Remember when I said that if someone were ritually clean, they would become, if somebody were ritually clean, they would become ritually unclean if they touched someone ritually unclean. The inbreaking of God's kingdom happens as Jesus touches the ritually unclean, and instead of him becoming unclean, the hemorrhaging woman and the little girl are made clean. They were born or reborn. They were healed and made new. Jesus turns all that upside down and all around. We heard this morning in our psalm today, we have turned, you have turned our mourning into dancing. You have taken off my sackcloth and clothed me with joy so that my soul may praise you and not be silent. The inbreaking of God's kingdom as Jesus proclaims it and shares it is hope for the hopeless. The normal is recreated into something new. It's better than the normal. It's even better than the new normal. The kingdom of God brings us new life. Even as Jesus is exhausted, putting up with people who are saying silly things, as he's fighting through his way through the chaos of life, he is focused on the kingdom of God, making all things new, bringing hope to the hopeless, delivering regenerative hope. We are called, brothers and sisters, to focus on the hope in the kingdom of God and share that hope with others. God has brought God's kingdom to us through God's only Son, Jesus Christ. God has claimed us and loves us, all of us. We are holders of the kingdom of God. And in response, we are called to love God and to love one another and to walk in that kingdom of hope. Not silently, but with vigor. Our example is to seek out the kingdom of God as Jarius and the ill woman did, as they sought out Jesus, desperate with what others thought, despite what others thought. Whether we are clean or unclean, God creates us new. So we shed our sackcloth and are clothed with joy. We are then to share that hope with others especially those on the margins, and clothe them with joy as well. As we find ourselves exhausted by the pandemic and social anxiety, as we stand in the face of those who say the silliest of things, as we fight our way forward for equality for all, we are called to focus on the kingdom of God, where all the birds find shade in the hope of God's kingdom. And as we are the kingdom of God holders, the last thing that we should settle for is going back to normal. Amen.